as I always do, welcome you to the evening Bible study today. And uh, we are going to have a little change today, and that is uh, the uh, we are going to take a break from our regular uh, series on spiritual disciplines. Uh, so Franklin has been, you know, raring to go uh, to bring this particular topic uh, with regards to, you know, the scientific facts uh, that confirms the Bible. So he's got a few aces up his sleeve. So today we'll have Franklin uh, lead us in the study. And also wanted to mention next week we are planning our convention. So we will take a break from Bible study. So next week, we won't, won't have a study on Wednesday. So since we are preparing for the convention and we will meet back on the 3rd of November, which is a, once again, a, you know, a, a, a Wednesday evening. And we will then take it to the end of the year and probably have a break during Christmas time and then start afresh next year. Right. And we are hoping that uh, Mr. COVID will wish us goodbye <laughs> and things will be better. Uh, we have been told that uh, in India, domestic flights now have 100 percent occupancy. So we are looking up. <laughs> uh, so we are happy to uh, you know, hear that. In any case, uh, before uh, Franklin, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilitates our study for tonight, uh, Give me the opportunity to lead you in a prayer today. Let's pray. Loving, gracious Father, as always on a Wednesday evening uh, for the past well, almost 18 months, it's been, a, it's been a, 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 such a joy and pleasure to be able to just connect with our brethren, especially in um, you know, places, remote places. Uh, we are so grateful to you for giving us this platform. And today as we continue to study your word and try to understand uh, the precious word you have preserved for us. Lord, we ask your guidance. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And especially at a time when we are going through conflicting uh, claims uh, in the world on various philosophies and religious belief systems, uh, sometimes life can become so confusing Bring us the precious and the clear word, Father, from your scriptures. I pray for Franklin to lead us and permit him into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for those of you who have just joined in, uh, today we are taking a break from our regular uh, sessions on spiritual discipline. Also wanted to mention that uh, next week, uh, Wednesday evening, we are taking a break, so we won't have Bible study next week. We will uh, meet back on the 3rd of November, which is, will be a Wednesday. So today, Franklin Propens will be leading us in the study. And so, Franklin, please take it away. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, good evening to you all. I'm just delighted and privileged to be here anchoring this study. Um, it's such a joy and a privilege and uh, I just want to thank our pastor for this opportunity. And I also want to thank all of you for coming here. Together we are learning and uh, we are, uh, what you call, we are uh, launching into, uh, into difficult horizons and we are trying to investigate science, a different subject. And we are trying to see how best we can understand scientific facts and connect it to the Bible. Okay, let's begin. Uh, when I, was, uh, when I was in my teens, in my school days, one of the things that I greatly desired was to understand what is right and what is wrong, uh, what is true and what is false. Uh, in my schooling, in class 12, I was a biology student. I was dissecting frogs and uh, uh, analyzing plants. And uh, uh, we used to have our biology classes in the first floor. And uh, just opposite to our building, there was a road leading to a church. St. Mary's Cathedral. And uh, my science teacher had a, I mean, he used to always pick on me. And he, he uh, one day on a Sunday morning, he asked me, uh, where are all these people going? They are all dressed in their bib and tucker. They are all smartly dressed, very attractive and carrying their Bibles. So I told them they are going to the Bible. He said, no, 
uh, God does not exist. Uh, then I paused. I uh, tried to uh, be a little polite to him and asked him, uh, sir, then how did man come on the earth? And he told me, uh, we, are the, uh, we, we came, our ancestors were uh, uh, monkeys. Our great grandparents were all apes, he told. Uh, then I said, okay, we should continue. So that, that particular question went straight into my heart. I mean, I'm a person now who's, who has intellectual honesty. We want to know what is truth. And so I embarked on a study, an invest, personal study and investigation. And it, it, within a year or two, uh, my brother introduced me to the magazine called Plain Truth. Uh, it's a beautiful, it was a solid magazine. It was touching on the uh, topics that we deal every day. And uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, two of the, uh, I mean, Garnet Ed Armstrong, many of you will re remember, he was an, uh, uh, what he called a flamboyant, hard hitting uh, speaker and a writer. I enjoyed his articles day in and day out. He, along with Paul, with another writer, Paul Crow, they used to keep blasting the scientists. I said, oh, bah, this is too much. But, uh, uh, but uh, Garnet Ed Armstrong, who was my hero, clearly explained to me what the Bible says. Uh, he made it eminently plain that there are, God has instituted two laws. The law of biogenesis. We all know life comes only from pre-existing life. God, who is life, imparted life to us. We who have life give, I mean, bring children into the world. The law of biogenesis. Science cannot, under, under controlled conditions, even if they have the primordial cell, even if they have proteins, they cannot produce what we call life. There's a second law that Garner Ted Armstrong taught me, and that is the law of its kind. Uh, today, we call it macro and micro evolution. Micro evolution means it is referring to the changes within a, uh, within a particular kind. The species keep cha changing. That is called microevolution. When you say macroevolution, what it means is the dogs are becoming horses. Horses are becoming monkeys. Monkeys are becoming. Uh, that is totally prohibited in the Bible. God specifically said, if you read the creation account, that uh, God has set demarcations and he has defined the boundary markers. Each will produce after its kind. And so I was convinced and I was so happy I could do further study and research. And that study and research continues even to this day. And so, uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, today I want to share with you only two simple fundamental facts with you. These are scientific facts uh, discovered in the past 100 years. Uh, the last century has seen phenomenal uh, rise of science. Science, uh, I mean, uh, what you call, there was a progress by leaps and bounds. Let's look at what science, and we're going to look at uh, two scientific facts. But before we do that, uh, let me make a few comments on what is the Bi on the Bible and science. The Bible, we all know that the Bible is not a scientific book. Yet, uh, I like what Herbert W. Armstrong uh, said, you know, he said the Bible is the foundation of all knowledge. It does not contain the sum total of knowledge, but it gives you knowledge that is otherwise not discernible. I, I, I greatly love this definition. I mean, see, the problem here is we, 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 the, the writer in the psalmist says, thy word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Friends, the Bible is our foundation for our life. When you and I don't use the Bible as our foundation, we are going to come into serious problems. We are going to come into hot water. Uh, uh, permit me to be a little bold and even provocative. Uh, let me put it this way. If the Bible is not our foundation, all knowledge is flossy, nossy, nihi, nipi, nification. Uh, please don't get uh, confused. This is the longest word in the English vocabulary. It's a 29 letter word. It simply means useless. Uh, what I'm trying to say is if if, if the Bible is not our foundation for life, then all the knowledge becomes flossy, nossy, nihi, leapy, leafy, kitchen. So it becomes useless. And that is why the Bible says, you know, uh, in much learning, there is much sorrow. Uh, did you know why? On the contrary, brethren, when you and I make the Bible as our foundation becomes, the study of 
the study of knowledge, the study of the creation, the, the acquisition of knowledge becomes an exciting adventure. It becomes so exciting, you be, like Isaac Newton, you will begin to admire the, the genius behind the law of gravity. And you will say, what a great God he is. And you will want to know more. And brethren, Christianity uh, will helps you to probe further into the reality, ultimate reality, and that is uh, not uh, matter or material, matter and energy, but God. And God has already inducted you and me through his son to be his dear children. The question is, are you and I willing to accept that invitation? So when you make the Bible as a foundation, it will lead you to further study and you will begin to understand the personal God behind creation. Okay, having said that, now let me make a few comments on what science is. You see, the word science refers to natural sciences, physics, chemistry, botany, zoology. Uh, a word on what theory? We all hear there is a theory of evolution. There is a theory of Big Bang. What does theory mean? Uh, now, in science, uh, the, the scientists, there is, in science is not in the business of proving or disproving a particular thing. But what they do is they evaluate a particular model on the merits of a simplicity, a clarity, and comprehensiveness. And then, this, they, and then this particular theory becomes uh, acceptable. So there is no such thing as right or wrong in theory. It only means na, what is acceptable. A theory means what is generally acceptable, true or agreeable or true. So it is not, uh, it is not a law or it is not provable. That's one thing. Another thing I want to say is, you see, science is based on some assumptions. People are, scientists are able to do their scientific research because there are underlying assumptions. And I want you to understand this. Uh, before I uh, explain this, uh, let me acknowledge, uh, I have prepared today's presentations courtesies to the following people. Uh, uh, John Lennox, Professor Emeritus Mathematics, and William Lane Craig, and then he's a research professor and professor in philosophy, and uh, our own uh, Grace Communion International uh, website, GCIORG. There are excellent articles. If you are serious in wanting to know a particular aspect, please visit uh, any of these sites and you can, you can learn uh, much about it. Okay, coming back to, uh, to my point, uh, science. Science is based upon assumptions. You see, uh, 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 Dr. William Craig says that science, uh, the, the Bible furnishes the conceptual framework in which science flourishes. The Bible furnishes the conceptual framework in which science can flourish. Uh, what are those assumptions? You see, there is science is based on the laws of logic. Science is based on the orderly nature of universe. Science is based on the reliability of our cognitive faculties in knowing the world. Science is based on the intelligibility of the, on the rational intelligibility of the world. Science is based on the assumption that there is mathematical in intelligibility in the physical world. These are all assumptions. Now, please remember, let's remember that these are not scientific statements and they cannot be scientifically proved, but these are philosophical statements and the Christ Judo-Christian worldview is the only worldview we can substantiate all of these assumptions. And it is because of this, uh, we can substantiate it, uh, the scientists are able to do their work of science and uh, go ahead. Okay, having said that, let's move into our, uh, let's move into our study. Uh, today, the purpose of my study is to share with you two scientific facts that have come to light convincingly over the past century. The first is about the universe. The un in simple words, the, the fact is the fact is the universe had a beginning. Uh, why do I say that? See, before 1920, <coughs> before 1920, uh, atheists and, sci and some scientists believed the Earth existed eternally. There was no beginning. The Earth just existed for eternity. But in 19, from 1920 onwards, evidence started trickling in. And I should say, they started pouring in to such an extent, the scientists can no longer duck and dodge the question whether there were science 
did not begin. Okay, at this point, now let me uh, play. Uh, let me explain to you the subject. We are talk going to talk about the origin of the universe. The fact is, the universe had a beginning. Now, you, if you read the Bible, you will know the very first verse in the Bible says, and God created the heavens and the earth. It was there millennia ago, and people did believe it. But somewhere along down the line, the, the, their outlook changed and their perspective changed. And people thought it is not a correct value. It is not a, a correct explanation. So we are going to deal, uh, the study of the universe is known as cosmology. Now, cosmology is, is, a, is a branch of astrophysics. <coughs> In, now, cosmology can be further divided into two parts. Uh, the one branch deals with uh, what we call the origin. And the second branch deals with, with the ultimate fate of the universe. The first branch is known as cosmogony. Cosmogony, G-O-N-Y, cosmogony. It, it deals with how did the universe come into existence. The second branch is known as eschatology. Now, when I say eschatology, all Christians should be able to understand what is this. Uh, eschatology deals with the ultimate fate of the universe. <coughs> Uh, the physical eschatology is different from the uh, theological eschatology in the sense that the physical eschatology is confined to the ultimate fate of the universe, but the theological eschatology deals the scope of it is much more wider. And having said this, at this point, let me play to you a short animated video. It's only for four minutes. Uh, please listen carefully, and then uh, we will. I will make a few comments, and then we will have a discussion. Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin, or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy, and that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, 
but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Okay, uh, may I make a few comments and then uh, we'll, we will have, we will throw it open for comments and for uh, questions. Okay. So the universe had a beginning. That is a fact. Now there are two lines of two independent in, uh, but interrelated lines of argument. The first is first evidence for the beginning of the cos cosmos is evidence from the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the, ther the second law simply states that if had the universe run for all eternity, the usable energy would have been over by now, and life will come to a standing grinding halt. So the universe. Uh, had a, sp a specific beginning in the past. The second line of evidence is the uh, scientific evidence coming in. The first evidence came in 1970 from Albert Einstein, then in 1927, then again in 1929, we had what is called the redshift, uh, Ed uh, Edwin Hubble's. Edwin Hubble not only showed that the, that the universe is, uh, had a beginning, uh, but it no the Edwin Edwin Hubble showed not only is the universe expanding, but it also had a single point in the finite past. He, he brought in a new component, and this was a monumental discovery, which convincingly showed that that the universe had a cosmic beginning. And then in two thousand three, uh, three scientists went on, and then uh, again in two thousand twelve. There was a model presented as, uh, you know, the, according to the accepted uh, theory, the universe came into existence by the Big Bang theory. This is known as the standard Big Bang theory. But in 2012, what happened was uh, a model was presented that uh, uh, we have what is called uh, uh, space-time boundary. When you say the universe began at a particular point of time, we are saying there was a singularity of time-space we call that the boundary mark. So what existed beyond the boundary mark? Nothing existed according to the standard model. So the, according to the standard Big Bang theory, it means the universe began in, in, at a point when time-space singularity was available. But in 2012, the scientists produced one more model saying that uh, there is what is called quantum vacuum or quantum gravity. But this, uh, this model failed because the quantum vacuum, the gravity is not stable and it is temporal. So it fails. So today, the accepted theory for the beginning of the universe is the Big Bang theory. Uh, that's the theory. Uh, according to this theory, the universe keeps expanding and expanding. Um, it's like a cone shaped, you know, it begins at a particular point, one end of the cone is pointed and the other end keeps expanding and expanding. The, the, the point at which begins is known as singularity of time and space or the boundary mark. Um, and uh, that is the point where uh, when, the, when there was singularity, the creation, the universe came into existence and we have creation ex nihilo, that is creation out of nothing. And then, in the, uh, and then we go, can go on and say, now the Big Bang theory is widely accepted. We can see many things about the Big Bang theory, but we will not go into that, those details. We will take only one point, and that is there was a, a finite beginning in the past. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, 
God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So what people, so that people are without excuse. And uh, with those comments, I now uh, leave it for your comments or questions. Please go ahead and ask your questions. Mr. Franklin? Yes, sir. You are finished or you are, you are still to speak? Yes, sir. Have you finished? Yes, sir. I or... please, now, please tell me. <clears throat> when you talk about the theory of evolution with anybody, who believes in theory of evolution, you should meet him only on the theory of evolution on scientific ground. You should not bring in Bible or God because you are going to contest him purely on scientific grounds. If you contest him on the scientific grounds, there is ample evidence, proof that life did not come from life. Life came only from life. Matter comes only from matter. It doesn't come from nothing. And um, the, in the argument you can prove that the man who is talking on theory of evolution is stupid, totally unscientific. For example, uranium, uranium-235. Uranium-235 still exists. If the, if the universe came, uh, how many years, billions of years ago? I don't know, 14 billion of years ago, they say. If the universe came into existence 14 billion of years ago, there will not be any uranium today. Today it will be only lead. Whatever evidence is available in the world on the theory of evolution is that it is a bogus, bogus theory. There is no evidence. Theory, even the word theory is not applicable to that. If it is to be a theory, it has to be based on some, some data are facts. This theory is based on no data, no evidence. Till today, there is no evidence to say how the Big Bang occurred. How did, how, how did nothing exploded and something happened? But why I am saying you keep the Bible aside is that you ought to meet him purely on the grounds of science the person who is talking on theory of evolution. God has given ample evidence of a creator God, but he has not given scientific evidence as to who is God or the creator, who is the God which created. That is, we can understand who is the creator God only by faith. That we can, only God can bring us to that faith. It cannot be proven by science. So it is true. It is better to keep both points separate. Uh, there are many more ideas, but uh, I just wanted to say this. Thank you, Mr. Surya Murthy. I'll just make two comments. And after that, I will ask someone to uh, tell me what is, what is your question. The first comment is the universe is, uh, Mr. Surya Murthy, you're perfectly correct. Uh, around 14 billion, 13.7 billion old, number one. Number two, I'm making a very limited point. All I'm saying is the Big Bang theory says the universe had a beginning. And this confirms the Bible statements in the beginning, God made heaven and earth. So the scientific uh, uh, evidence is confirming the validity of the Bible. Uh, 
Can somebody please explain what uh, what is uh, Mr. Suryamurthy's question? What I want to say, Mr. Franklin, do not fix up science and the Bible in the beginning. In a, because Bible has no scientific evidence. It is merely faith. Whereas theory of evolution, they say it is science. It is not science. According to science, if they are scientists, how can something come out of nothing? Essentially, Big Bang theory is that something came out of nothing. Is there any evidence? Is there any data? There is nothing. It is only imagination, fiction. So when you deal with the theory of evolution, with anybody who is talking on theory of evolution, you should meet him only on the grounds of science. Don't go into the grounds of Bible. That is a different thing. That the Bible confirms science and science confirms the Bible. That is a different matter. Yeah. Sir, can I, can I please respond to you? The Bible yes. is the inspired word of God. It is the infallible of word of God. It is uh, characterized by what we call as inerrancy. Now, when the Bible says in the beginning God created heaven, we are trying to confirm this from scientific data. Mr. Franklin, I am not disputing that. Yeah. But on the point of theory of evolution, you are going to argue with a person who is not believing in the Bible, okay. who is not believing in, who is not having any faith in the creation. So how are you going to deal with that fellow? You are not going to bring in the Bible at all. I know Bible confirms science and science confirms the Bible. That is a different chapter altogether. If I can just come in here, uh, I think uh, Franklin Suryamurthy is making a statement. Uh, I don't think he is necessarily asked a question. So, uh, and that statement is valid in the sense that you can uh, debate science based on scientific fact. But if I can just mention, Suryamurthy, you, you, you said that uh, the Bible must be taken only on faith. Uh, I would say that even faith has evidence. Faith is not blind. Uh, even the faith that we have is backed up by evidence. Uh, but that's another subject. And we can uh, discuss that maybe later if we have time. But I had a question for you, Franklin. Uh, yes, and this, please, yeah, this will go against what uh, I'm <laughs> saying. Yes. My question is, yes. I mean, you, you seem to be indicating the Big Bang. Yes. Are you saying that the Bible confirms the Big Bang uh, postulation of the scientists? Or are you saying we don't know it just had a beginning? Is that what you're saying? Sir, uh, no, sir. Uh, both of them. Both. No, I am I am the correct answer. Sorry? <laughs> you, you asked me to answer that? No, no, no. I'm asking frankly. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sir, uh, both ways, sir. Uh, well, what I'm trying to say is science confirms Bible statements. And this, the, the, I think we can look at it from the other way also. The Bible says that this particular theory is correct. Now, sir, the Big Bang theory has got many aspects. The, how can something come out of nothing? A valid point raised by uh, Surya Murthy. Then there's another thing. How can uh, there are many, many, uh, there are many, many uh, aspects about Big Bang theory, but all those aspects can be can be answered by the Bible. But here I'm dealing with only a limited point, and the universe had a beginning. Okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, uh, Franklin. Uh, just that. There are some scientists, uh, sci uh, Christian scientists, who tend to say that, uh, you know, validate the Big Bang from the Bible. There is, a, I think, a verse in the Bible that says that God flung the stars into space. <laughs> I can't get the exact reference where it is. Uh, but they, they take that to prove that the Big Bang seemed to have, uh, seemed to be the way God created the universe. But then uh, uh, what you are saying is we just stick to the fact that there is there is a beginning. Right? Yes, a cosmic beginning. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So Big Bang refers to the uh, sudden uh, burst of, of, of uh, time, space, matter, energy, and all life. Uh, from where did it come? Science cannot answer. Only the Bible can answer. Uh, 
uh, something out of nothing. For instance, the king of quantum physics, uh, Stephen Hawking, makes a very makes a very interesting statement. He says because there is a law of gravity, uh, the the universe will create itself out of nothing. <laughs> Uh, I found this very odd. Here is a man with brilliant intellectual faculties. He's saying the, there is something and there is and there's nothing. And he says no, the universe will create itself out of nothing. So there's a lot of contradiction. So we believe that, but here we have taken a limited point. See, you are using the word scientist. And Mr. Zakai is also using the word scientist. The, when you say Mr. Swan was a scientist, it doesn't mean that he is talking in a scientific manner. God has sent a strong delusion. The so-called scientists are not total scientists because they do not follow the laws of science. Many of the things which they have said are pure imagination. So when you use the word scientist in this realm, I would say only so-called scientists, stupid so pseudo scientists. <laughs> they are deceiving. They are deceiving the people. Yes, Suramuthi, we concur with you. <laughs> you you concur, not you in a plural. You as a singular. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I understand, uh, you know, the context in which you're making that statement, but we have to be careful that we don't make sweeping statements and condemn all scientists as though they are quacks. Uh, I don't no, think that is right. And I no, think scientists, as scientists, scientists in the field of theory of evolution, I'm not talking about scientists in other field. Right. Yeah. So that, that, that I think has to be clarified so that we don't make you know, uh, statements that... No, I said that. I said that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Any other questions on this particular topic of the beginning of the universe? So science has given ample evidence that everything has to, was created by creator. It could not have been done. It could not, it could not have come automatically on its own. What I would suggest, Franklin, is I think, clear. yeah, yes. sorry, uh, go ahead, finish your story. Everything requires a creator. Yeah. There is okay. ample evidence for that. Absolutely, yes. Franklin, I think you have another point. What we can do is, why don't you finish your second point and then we can bring in all the other questions together, right? So go ahead. Sir, actually, sir, uh, the science flourish uh, because of Judeo-Christian uh, worldviews. Uh, yeah. Okay, sir, can we move to the second point? Okay, the second fact that I want to share with you all, uh, brothers and sisters, is a simple one. The, the physical world is structured on mathematics. The physical world is structured on mathematics. Mathematics is the foundation of the world. Uh, may I ask uh, uh, Praveen to play the second clip? It runs for five minutes. Why does mathematics work? Think about it. Mathematical entities like numbers, sets and equations are non-physical and abstract. They can't cause anything. Yet, for some reason, the physical universe operates mathematically. As Galileo put it, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Scientists do not use mathematics merely as a convenient way of organizing the data. They believe that mathematical relationships reflect real aspects of the physical world. Science relies on the assumption that we live in an ordered universe that is subject to precise mathematical laws. Thus, the laws of physics are all expressed as mathematical equations. For example, Pythagoras discovered that when a vibrating string is shortened by half, it plays the same note one octave higher. Isaac Newton's observations led to his discovery of the law of gravity, a mathematical relationship expressed as a simple equation that enabled us to enter the space age. Mathematics enabled astronomers to pinpoint the location of a previously undiscovered planet, and James Clerk Maxwell used mathematics to predict the existence of radio waves. 
Albert Einstein, working with theoretical mathematics developed 50 years earlier, formulated his General Theory of Relativity, a pillar of modern physics. His calculations were later confirmed during a solar eclipse, when Arthur Eddington observed light from distant stars bending around the Sun. Then, Peter Higgs used mathematical equations to predict the existence of an elementary particle. It took 48 years, billions of dollars, and millions of man-hours for experimental scientists to finally detect the Higgs boson. How do we explain the astonishing applicability of math to the physical world? In 1960, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist and mathematician Eugene Wigner published an article that stunned the scientific community entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Wigner concluded that the effectiveness of mathematics is a miracle, which we neither understand nor deserve. Why is mathematics so effective? Philosophers who address this question fall into two camps. Naturalists, who believe that all that exists concretely is space-time and its physical contents. They exclude supernatural causes. And theists, who believe in a god who created the universe. Naturalists cannot provide a reasonable explanation for why mathematics applies to the physical world. It's just a happy coincidence. But this is no explanation at all. At most, naturalists can say that it's not surprising that math applies to the world, because the world itself just happens to have a mathematical structure. So, of course, mathematics applies to it. But this explanation is unsatisfactory for two reasons. First, a great deal of mathematics in science cannot be physically realized. For example, imaginary numbers and infinite dimensional spaces. Although these concepts are useful, physical reality cannot possibly have the structure they describe. And second, this answer still doesn't explain why the physical universe has such a stunningly elegant mathematical structure. By contrast, for theists, mathematics works so well in the physical world because God has chosen to create the world according to the plan he had in mind. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria offered this analogy. When a king wants to build a city, a trained architect first designs in his mind a plan of all the parts of the city that are to be completed. Then he begins to construct the city out of stones and timber, looking at the model and ensuring that the material objects are built according to the plan. Mathematics and physics work so well together because the same mind that designed the universe on a mathematical model also built the universe on the same mathematical model. All of this adds up to an argument for the existence of God that goes like this. If God does not exist, the applicability of mathematics is just a happy coincidence. But the applicability of mathematics is not just a happy coincidence. Therefore, God exists. Eugene Wigner was right. The effectiveness of mathematics in the physical world is quite literally a miracle, which is best explained by the existence of God. Okay, three quick observations. Observation number one, Newton's law of gravity enabled us to make space explorations. Uh, Newton's law of gravity enabled us to launch into the space world. And that's why you were able to go to the moon, Jupiter, Mars, and all. All because they discovered the importance of mathematics. 1960, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner. I like the statement. I think this man hits the nail on the head. The effectiveness of mathematics is a miracle, which we neither understand nor deserve. Here is a scientist who's saying that there is a, a miracle occurred when, when mathematics was discovered. And one last question is, you see the, 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 the tussle is between naturalists and uh, theists, or I would say between naturalists and the believers. A naturalist cannot explain why mathematics works so effectively and beautifully, but a theist can do that. Now, let me connect this to the Bible. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, the, uh, the Bible says, God decreed that the universe operate on mathematical principles. 
Let me read to you from Job chapter 38, verses 4, 4 to 7. Or maybe I'll just stop at 4 to 6. Uh, Job 38, 4 to 6. Uh, Job is asking, uh, God is asking Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have, under if you have understanding. And verse 5, who determined its measure measurements? Surely you know. Who determined its measurements? Brethren, God used mathematical laws and principles when laying the foundation of the earth. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And verse 6 says, to whatever its it to what to what were its foundations fastened to, and who laid its cornerstone. And so, brethren, this particular discovery that mathematics is effective in this uh, in this physical world confirms that the Bible is true. Yes, please go ahead and shoot your questions. Anybody wants to ask you a question? No, I am just going to add something. Yeah. The universe exists not just on mathematics. It exists on the principles of physics, of chemistry, biology, physiology, everything. How did the laws, laws come into existence? For example, first law of Isaac Newton, second law of Isaac Newton, third law of Isaac Newton. How did they come into being? As I see, scientists assume their their form, his formulas are right. From where did the laws come? It is a law, law of physics, not not just mathematics. Of course, mathematics is there everywhere, but other principles also involved. Yes, that's all. It is not just mathematics. Franklin, your comments? Yes, sir. what's the question, sir? No, that's not a oh. question. It's just a statement that Story much is making. Okay. Yes, I'm adding yes, something. Okay. Okay. I'm adding okay. something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Surya Murthy, for sharing your thoughts. See, there are so many laws, so many laws in chemistry or physics, yes. biology, botany. How did the laws come into existence? Somebody must have put the laws in motion. Franklin, can I make a statement? No, please go ahead, sir. Uh, the video said that uh, mathematics is a language, <laughs> right? Yes. It's uh, it is identified as a unique language, yes. I, f I found that very interesting because uh, what I had with what I know, uh, language comes into existence because of intelligence. Or rather, I should say, language cannot exist just by random chance, which uh, you know some of the scientists seem to indicate that everything happens by random ch chance, right? But lang the existence of language shows there had to be prior intelligence. And so uh, in that respect, you know, the uh, existence of, uh, you know, the universe on the basis of mathematics and the laws that Suryamurti mentioned seem to indicate the prior existence of intelligence, not by random chance. I yes. thought I'll just make yes. that statement. Yes. Sir, uh, can I add to what you said, sir? Yeah. Uh, see, sir, the assumption, one of the assumptions of science is the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. Uh, there is what is called the rational intelligibility of the universe. And we also have uh, the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. It is precisely for this reason, the judo Christians embarked on, on studying uh, science and then making discoveries. Any other comments or thoughts on Franklin's presentation? Uh, <laughs> okay, otherwise, uh, 
I just wanted to, you know, we have about uh, a few minutes left. Um, you know, this, this uh, thought that we had uh, just explored a little bit earlier. You know, uh, we believe that God... Sir, one, minute, one second, sir. Yes, yes, go ahead. Can I just make one last concluding statement, sir? Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, the, the uh, science, modern science began in the 16th and the 17th century. The pioneers of modern science, uh, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, were all believers. And because they were believers, they studied nature. Wow. Why did they study nature? Because they expected laws in nature. Why did they expect laws in nature? Because they believed there is a great lawgiver and God is the lawgiver. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, once again, that uh, sequence is, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is logical. <laughs> yes. I, I just wanted to, you know, uh, in the remaining moments, uh, maybe some, some thoughts you can share. Uh, we have faith. You know, we believe uh, on faith. Uh, is faith, does faith have evidence or is faith ever, without any evidence? Do you believe without evidence or do you believe with evidence? What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. Surimurti, you wanted to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. It is uh, my understanding that God has left ample evidence in the world for every human being, for every human being, not necessarily a so-called scientist, that there is a creator. I move along with a lot of Hindus, most of them say, Bhagwan to hai, Bhagwan to hai, some creator is there. So, to that extent, God has left evidence, but he has not left ample evidence to show who is the real God. To that extent, I think God brings us by faith. In my case also, I had no evidence. He brought it by faith. I think, I think God uses that, uses that aspect of faith to bring us into contact with Him. He has not provided any any scientific evidence. Okay, thank you, Surimurti. So what you're saying is, the Christian faith has no evidence. Is that uh, a, a fair is, conclusion? There is no scientific evidence mm -hmm. to who is the real God. Okay. Any any thoughts on that? Others have any thoughts? Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, according to uh, what he calls, sir, um, according to neo-Darwinists or according to uh, atheistic scientists, they say religion is based on uh, faith. Science is based on facts. Religion is based on faith. Science is based on facts. But theory, but theory <laughs> of revolution is based on faith. <laughs> theory of evolution is based on faith. Yeah, we are, but let's talk about the Christian faith. I think, Shanti, you had a thought? Uncle, you were asking about the faith and evidence. Is there evidence of faith? Right. I wanted to quote uh, Hebrews 11, 1. Okay, that is the faith, the faith definition. <laughs> that is a faith definition, yes. And so, evidence of things not yet seen. Um, and it clearly sums up, because for us, uh, we can always connect our Bible. See, the best part of a human mind is we can connect anything to anywhere, isn't it? That is how all these so-called, uh, you know, Babas that we see and all that, kahi bhi, kahi se bhi, kuch bhi connect karke, they bring out this theology like that. Uh, and so, um, for that reason, we can always say, this is based on this, this will become like this, so this is this is what it is being spoken about. Or this ruin is this, we can always say that. But 
for us Christians, um, faith is trusting in something that is not yet there, but we know will happen for sure. Like for example, we can always say the universe is expanding. That is science. It is expanding at a fa much faster rate than we can ever calculate. That is what the science is saying right now. And so even if you start on a rocket today, we will never reach the end because it will always keep expanding. But for us as Christians, when we see, we know that there will be a new earth and a new, and new heaven. Which is earth, which is heaven at the end of the day. So, you know, for us, I feel somehow we can't even... Yes, we can take it as science. Yes, it helps explain a lot of things and gives us a little bit of logic into our lives. But at the end of the day, we ought to realize that we are not of this world. And so when we say base everything only, it has to be science based. Then there is a, a big divide that happens. Because for us Christians, our faith is to keep our, uh, you know, uh, the hope that we have and uh, the evidence is in the things that are not yet seen. But we know for sure will happen. Right. Okay. Thank you, Shanti. I think, uh, you know, what we have to, uh, one, one uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, objection that the atheists make against the Christian faith is that it is irrational. Blank. And ir irrational, irrationality comes because there is no evidence. You just believe in some mythology. But is that true with the Christian faith? You know, that is what uh, I want to know. Uh, Anil, you, you had a thought? Or Rekha? But history and archaeology has proved that. Biblical archaeology is proving it. History is proving it. And from beginning, there, there are evidence. There is evidence. But, we, but for us, God has to put that in our minds before we can really move on that path. The Holy okay. Spirit has to. You know, there is uh, actually, I agree with Sulimoti, that there is no actual specific scientific evidence of God. I mean, there's archaeological evidence, there is creation and all that, but there is no like a mathematical equation where it says this and this was this, square space integral this equals God. So to okay. that extent, yes, I think a lot of, a uh, whole lot of faith comes into our uh, belief system and it's not just scientific. And, and I, I agree that science alone cannot prove the existence of God. Okay. 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 Rabin, you had a thought. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. Number one, I would like to address what Mr. Suryamurthy said, a single statement saying, uh, uh, Christian faith did not, uh, God did not give us enough evidence uh, to figure out who is the true body. Any scientific evidence? Yeah, even if you take. Uh, no, even otherwise. If you take. Even otherwise, there, is, there is no evidence of. Uh, God has not given evidence that this is the true God. Yeah, I'll come to that later. Two points I would like to make. Uh, one primarily thing is uh, there is only one true God. There, uh, there are no other gods. Actually, we have created all the false gods. We created our own confusion. And now we are asking, God did not give us enough evidences to find uh, the true God is. That is our human situation, number one. And uh, second thing is about uh, faith and uh, reason. Uh, logic we are talking we humans have a tendency if something we don't understand we say that it doesn't exist if we humans don't understand something then we say that is wrong so there are so many areas so many things like uh, you cannot uh, define uh, biological things with physics you cannot define uh, physical th th things that are related to physics with biology so the, the thing is, uh, saying faith does not have reason doesn't, doesn't work actually. Faith does not have evidence, doesn't work actually. Faith has evidence, faith has reason. And that reason may not be a scientific reason always. But it has its own uh, it has an example. Let me tell you about, uh, I talk about my, my wife. I know what she is doing. If I, if I fall down, she will come and pick me up. I have this confidence. I have this faith. And what is the proof? I cannot show any proof. All of us, we have, we have relationships and everywhere. We trust somebody and uh, we don't have any evidences to show. That is completely based on our relationship with the person. So there are, they, what, I'm, what I've meant to say is there are so many dimensions which we are not open to yet. 
so so we what we say is we have only two dimension knowledge and we are judging four dimension things that's what we all our uh, discussions are going on uh, even with the science our science is presently dealing with some few dimensions of life and god is a god of infinite dimensions and with this limited knowledge we are judging that the other thing is not there so it is just like see if we have something very close to us something very big we won't be able to see it and we say we there it, it doesn't exist so that is a problem we humans have we are open to limited knowledge limited dimensions god is unlimited and he is in god of infinite possibilities and since we are not able to understand them we say he doesn't exist that is our tendency whatever we don't understand whatever we do not know from even the when we tell, when we hear about some new tea, some, some some teaching which we hear for the first time it is very difficult for us to take it we dissect it and uh, we de deconstruct it and we try to understand the things according to our own understanding so we don't understand the things the way they are we understand the things the way we are so we are judging the unlimited with the limited knowledge and we are saying he did not leave us enough uh, scientific evidences even in science who knows about this nanotechnology before no one knows so as we are being open to new dimensions of science maybe one day we are going to understand him now one day we are going to realize all the scientific evidences that he has left for us and ultimately a great uh, scientific i can say a great scientific uh, evidence he left in us is the spiritual aspect of life and the relational aspect of life these are also signs actually we cannot uh, neglect uh, spiritual and uh, sp relational aspects out of science so there we can find enough evidences also so this is one of the uh, one of the points i would like to say i'm not saying there are we should not look at uh, scientific uh, other scientific evidences uh yes i think so uh, sriburthy you had a thought go ahead so you raised the question about how the people also view the bible as irrational am, am i right are they say our faith is irrational because we have no evidence faith is irrational yeah, what was your question you said something i know i had no question i was just saying that there are people who like to uh, negate the biblical uh, faith by saying that our faith is is irrational because of there being no evidence not only that the people who are outside who do not know god when they read the bible when they hear something from the bible they consider it irrational because there are there are so many things which are irrational in the bible from their human point of view they cannot understand whatever is mentioned is irrational right have i made it clear to you okay yeah that, that's very true i mean there are lots of things that in the bible which we the viewers don't understand obviously so, uh, so for the outsider so the outsider uh, without god's guidance is justified in every way to think that it has lot of irrational things uh, one more thing what i want to say sir that's why faith comes in yes the <clears throat> science means a study of things by data observation not by faith what shanti says according to shanti she is quoting that hebrews definition of faith not things seen not things seen so that's why science cannot understand the bible yeah okay well i guess uh, we have uh, exhausted the time yes uh, sachin you wanted to say something yeah no no just i wanted to add something i i say i have a hypothesis <laughs> our 
our testimony is the evidence of our faith and then in the next few days i want each of us to just try and correlate every time we have a revelation and a correlation we have a testimony otherwise it's me it's me somebody i have known have done something for me or i have done with my own wisdom and power i have done so there is no testimony the testimony itself brings the evidence to our faith and the, the testimony is built up our uh, uh, what do you say built up our hope in the things that we have not seen and perhaps in a lifetime sometime we some things we will not see the life forever it just will something that we will experience okay yes thank you sachin uh uh that testimony is not uh, uh testable under a test tube right <laughs> so it is it is uh, beyond science <laughs> right yes um i guess uh, we want to thank franklin for uh, spurring an interesting debate uh thank you franklin for uh you know adding to our understanding and knowledge uh, maybe you know since uh, uh, maybe it is fitting for me to end by just reading what 1 corinthians 15 says something that we all have read many a times talking about evidence the bible you know seem to point to something uh, which is uh, extremely powerful 1 corinthians 15 it says if christ has not been raised your faith is worthless you are still in your sins so uh, if there is one powerful evidence of the christian faith uh, then you have to prove disprove the resurrection of jesus christ and i don't think anybody has done that convincingly so far they have all tried but uh, nobody has really you know hit the nail on the head uh, with that i think uh, we thank you for joining us today and uh, just wanted to mention that next week we are taking a break because we are moving into the convention and uh, we will meet back on the 3rd of november so to end things uh, can i request such and since you are here with us can you lead us in a closing yeah. prayer sure please join me as we pray heavenly father gracious lord we come before your throne of grace and mercy with thanksgiving in our heart we thank you for this time thank you for your sp- holy spirit revealing us your heart giving us understanding to understand things that are beyond our understanding mm-hmm. and we want to thank you lord for that wisdom and for that knowledge I want to thank you for uh, mr franklin popins for bringing in this topic uh, and bringing in uh, the clarity and the uh, supportive uh, n- knowledge and the theories a lot so we want to thank you lord thank you for this time uh, i want to thank you for, uh, on behalf of each one of us a lord thank you for continuing to uh, uh, in increase our knowledge of your yeah. understanding uh, our knowledge of your being o lord and we continue to pray o lord that uh, continue to do so i want to thank you f- uh, on behalf of each one of us o lord we submit our lives into your hand i want to thank you and bless you in jesus name we pray Amen.